afternoon and welcome and welcome to uh, our speaker today, uh, Professor Sean Kay. Uh, hasn't been has spoken here twice before in the past, but not for about seven or eight years, I think. Um, and things have there's been a, some change in American politics and foreign affairs since since that since that time. Um, Sean is the Robinson Professor of Politics and Government at Ohio Wesleyan University and, and, and Mershon Associate at the Mershon Center for International um, Security Studies at neighboring Ohio State U University. Um, he's done a range of things in his career <clears throat> and has also advised the Obama campaign on security and defense issues in 2008 and the Bernie Sanders campaign in 2016. Um, he's going to talk to us about many of the aspects of American politics and how it affects all our lives. Sean, welcome. Great, cheers. Well, it's very, very nice to be here. Uh, I've always uh, had an incredible respect for the role that this institute uh, plays here in Dublin and in Europe, and and uh, and, and we we listen very, very closely uh, in the states, especially when we hear from Dan O'Brien. So I'm very, very happy to be here. It's a privilege to see you again. Um, what I'll do today is. Uh, try to pontificate about th something we have no idea about what's going to happen. <laughs> so that's the first thing I should tell you. Your guess is as good as mine. Uh, but uh, I tell that to my students as well. I have a PhD in these things, and I have no idea what's going on. So who am I and why am I here? Um, what I'm going to try to do is give you some trend lines that, that at least I think help understand why the Trump phenomenon has come about uh, and what that has meant electorally talk a little bit about uh, the conditions or circumstances in which foreign policy uh, is important in, in American political campaigns, both in primaries and uh, general election, and try to give you a little bit of the current play uh, of what's going on now, and then conclude with some implications for uh, Europe and Ireland as well. Um, and I should tell you at the outset, I, I am an informal um, uh, advisor on defense issues for uh, the campaign of Mayor Pete Buttigieg, um, uh, but I speak only for myself here, and anything you hear from me should not in any way be associated with that. Uh, so this is just purely academic stuff. Um, uh, the, um, so um, how did it happen in 2016 that we all woke up and thought, my gosh, <laughs> what happened, what went on, right? How did Donald Trump get there in the first place? Well, I think some of these trends actually go back pretty far in American history. I mean, if you, if you look at George Washington, he warned about entangling alliances, right? He warned about uh, long-term commitments. He, he said you should engage with other countries but not make judgments about them politically and whatnot. Now, I'm not drawing direct parallels between George Washington and Donald Trump, but I am drawing parallels between these notions and these ideas. They're actually deeply rooted in the American historical and political culture, right? So that's one key part. You had presidents like Don Quincy Adams, too, who said that America should not go out searching for monsters to destroy and things like that, that we should stay at home. And as you know, we have this long tradition of isolationism, you know, especially from Europe in particular, right? So that passion has been there for some time. But also in the run-up to 2016, you really saw, a, at least in foreign policy, a culmination of decades of um, kind of a loose consensus, I, I refer to it, of uh, liberal interventionists and uh, neoconservative Republicans, um, which culminates in the Iraq War and the Afghanistan War and endless wars, which are still going on now, right? And so um, you also had even things like, you know, arguments about burden sharing. One, one talk I gave here some time ago, I, I mentioned, it was about NATO and burden sharing, and I did say that if, 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 if we can't get this balance right, Somebody's going to come along and demagogue this issue politically, um, that, that the Europeans should pay more and do more, and you know, that they're just basically freeloading on the American public, right? Uh, which is not accurate by any means, but uh, politically resonates um, uh, to a degree. So, um, so there's a long tradition in America of, 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 of uh, if you look at public opinion polls, um, that, that people favor restraint. They, they, they favor... Um, not isolationism now, but they, they do have a, a preference for uh, staying out of wars if possible and engaging adversaries. Uh, I mean, there's been polling way before Donald Trump, like 70% of the American public said, yes, we should talk with North Korea, for example, right? So everyone criticized Donald Trump. We did the thing with the Kurds on Syria recently, 
I think that's not an unpopular move, actually, among much of the American public. It's not popular, though, in Washington circles, where you hear these, the, the foreign policy circles, with good reason, because who would now trust America after we betrayed the Kurds on the ground, right? I mean, that's a serious problem in terms of future policy making. Um, but some other things were a little weirder, um, like the realignment of the Republican Party into a position of unquestioning uh, approaches towards Vladimir Putin of Russia. Uh, uh, that's, that's, a, that's a new thing. This was, of course, the party of anti-communism and anti-Soviet and, and you know, wanted to enlarge NATO because we keep the Russians down and things like that. And, and now that's uh, totally inverted, um, and that's odd. I, I, none of us really can understand that, um, uh, that look at this. Now, um, but also Donald Trump won uh, by succeeding in places, interestingingly enough, where Barack Obama had succeeded. We were just talking about this earlier, but Wisconsin, Michigan, and Pennsylvania, all right? This was the key to the whole thing. And he won in key counties in Wisconsin that had twice voted for Barack Obama. So it's kind of hard. I mean, racism was out there. There was a whole lot of sexism and other things. But in these counties, uh, it was trade policy. Uh, that was that these and it wasn't even a, it was more the sense of dislocation that people had had that trade had left them behind these communities that were and I see them I live around them in Ohio and other places you know and it's true it's a real thing um, and this is also why Bernie Sanders was very popular in 2016 that he also resonated uh, rightly or wrongly on the substance but resonated with this notion of trade as a serious problem um, all right so what you end up with is a sense of sort of cultural dislocation. Um, and, but what's ironic is that for the diehard Trump voters, they're the ones he's actually lied to the most. Um, and so it's a little bit tricky to understand why they're so unquestionably uh, with him on things. Uh, but they are, right? And he's got a problem now because he can't afford to lose them. So when he goes to these rallies, he's got to fire them up. And they do get a lot of data on who's the voters and whatnot. But if there's one reason why there was a big surprise, and it shouldn't have been, we saw polling in the summer of 2015 that showed that in those states that I just mentioned, Hillary Clinton had honest and trustworthy uh, ratings of about 30%, right? which is not a good number going in. And people had made that judgment call already. Um, and she was relying very heavily on women in suburbs uh, to turn on Trump, which has happened, actually, but it didn't happen in her election because party affiliation uh, turned out to be stronger, actually. I remember there was a survey out of Philadelphia Inquirer that asked, when did you decide, uh, of a, a, a woman a Republican, and, and they interviewed her after the survey in um, Philadelphia suburb, and she said, when did you decide you didn't want to vote for Hillary Clinton? She said, 1989. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, and also then finally you had one of the most anti-establishment elections in a period of time when the Democrats ran the most establishment candidate you could probably find, okay? So there was a backlash to that. Um, but what's problematic here is that he does have that base in these rallies, right? And, and he can't lose them. If he loses them, he's got nothing going into this election. Uh, and so, you know, that's a real problem politically because it, it prevents him even if he wanted, which I don't think he does, but if he wanted to move towards the middle and reach out and expand his base, right? But he hasn't expanded his base, okay? He's narrowed it even more. And, and so, you know, I think that there's any, any scenario here where um, Donald Trump could get reelected to which a ham sandwich could defeat Donald Trump, maybe a toasted ham sandwich. Uh, you know, but, but somewhere in between is what we're going to find out, right? So then the question is, what are the variables in between now and then that can lead to that? Uh, and some of them are international. Impeachment, obviously, is something we can talk about that during the q and I'm happy to. Uh, but there's some other issues, Brexit, you know, trade, um, the trade... Um, uh, tariffs and whatnot uh, could lead to some economic dynamics that could be problematic for him, right? Um, if we even just in a normal cycle into recession again, right? These kind of things could either get his base even more riled up, or it could get them some people to turn on him a bit too. <clears throat> um, the um, other issues like NATO and things like that, right? These are policy problems, but they're coming under threat and challenge, and some you know fundamental institutions of foreign policy could come back and have an impact as well. But I, I think some of these things just go so much deeper. You know, we're talking about uh, wherever anyone sits politically. We're talking about an administration that took children at the border from their parents and put them in cages 
Now I'm here as an American on Thanksgiving to tell you how appalling I find that, you know, and and I think a lot of uh, Americans privately, even if they're for Trump, also would find that deeply appalling. But they also like tax cuts, <laughs> and they also like, um, you know, A, B, C, or D judges, Supreme Court especially, right? And so he's found a way to tap into that uh, quite successfully. Um, the reputational costs are huge, but my sense is that the world is kind of waiting us out and to see, you know, what comes next. And um, the challenge for the Democrats will be, will they reconcile the kind of d dilemmas that led into leading up to the Trump phenomenon? Or, you know, or will they just think, oh, well, now we're back, everything's grand, right? And my guess is it won't be. Uh, and I think that they're going to have to figure out uh, some different approaches to, to a whole range of issues. But in a, in a normal circumstance, no wars, or no new wars, I suppose, and economic prosperity at home, right? Typically, those would be pretty grand design for a overwhelming re-election for any incumbent president, right? So that alone, you got to start with as a potential strong point that could get him across the finish line, you know? Um, it's even possible that he could get re-elected and lose the popular vote by many millions more. He lost by three million last time. He could lose the popular vote by many millions more votes, but still win the Electoral College um, because of you know, how our system is set up, uh, as he did last time. Um, but there's also some demographic trends that are going on. And, 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 and every election, in, including a place like Kansas and Alabama, and uh, just recently in Louisiana and right next door to me in Kentucky, every chance since then that there's been a vote, uh, people in very red conservative states have been voting for the Democrat. Um, and so that also suggests a trend line that's coming. And the key trend has been shifts in the suburbs. Um, and it's, it's women voters in particular, and they're concerned about uh, gun control, they're concerned about health care, and they're concerned about the environment. And the Republican Party is not talking about any of those issues. They're not resonating with them. Now, you could have lots of disagreements on the issues, but they're not even acknowledging th these things as policy concerns. You know, so, well, health, well, I mean, Obamacare, they want to get rid of it, right? That kind of thing, which would hurt, actually, Donald Trump supporters probably the most, uh, which is, again, ironic. All right, so, um, but I would posit that there are scenarios here where Donald Trump can be reelected, okay? And a lot of that has to do with what goes on with the Democrats. Um, so that's where I'll turn to next. Um, foreign policy, uh, uh, which is kind of at the root of my, my work anyway, um, is not a huge thing in, 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 dem in primaries. Uh, it's, you want to show that you could be commander in chief, uh, that kind of thing. Sorry, excuse me. You'd want to show that you can, you know, uh, that have good judgment. A lot of times experience has, like, like with Hillary Clinton versus Barack Obama, did not win out over judgment, the argument of judgment on the war in Iraq in particular, right, that Obama was opposed to. Now, who knows? He was a state senator at the time, and he'd actually been in the Senate. He might have actually, we don't know, you know, but, but it worked for his advantage. Um, Hillary Clinton refused to, quote, unquote, apologize for her vote on Iraq. Uh, Joe Biden voted for the war in Iraq, but it's kind of been vetted since then, and he, he has recognized in his view it was a mistake to do it he, uh, and so forth. That's just not a huge issue anymore. And so mainly we do see these things manifest. Hillary Clinton ran campaigns against Barack Obama where there's a, it's the middle of the night, it's 3 a.m., the phone rings, you know, who's going to pick up that phone, right? Do you want, you know, a junior guy from Illinois that no one's heard of, or do you want, you know, experienced, you know, that kind of thing. Um, so that kind of, that can play. The Democrats have a bigger problem, actually, which is that all these, remember I mentioned before, the Republican neoconservatives, these are like the pro-war, uh, pro, you know, really engagement stuff. They're going to prob many of them are never, never Trumpers, right? And so they will support probably the Democrat. Um, and what kind of expectations in return will they be looking for? jobs, you know, positions, influence, outcomes, right? So that's an interesting problem because this is the team that brought us into Iraq and has kept us in Afghanistan and other places as well. Um, so the Democrats are, are having a little bit of a debate, uh, not a lot, but a little bit about um, Afghanistan, but, but they're all in a race to get out as fast as possible, which is a contradiction because they're also saying, oh, we should have stayed in Syria, right? Um, and so uh, the Democrats have to kind of figure out their approach to wars and foreign policy. 
Uh, they're going to have to eat. There, there's, there's internal conflicts that they have on climate change. Even though they all agree on the substance of the problem, you've got plans that vary from Bernie Sanders that would cost as much as, I think, $30 trillion or something like that. Now, maybe not, so, excuse me, 16. 16 was the number. I'm, I'm, that's, uh, that's the health care plan is uh, $32 trillion. Um, that's a lot of money, right? <laughs> Where is it going to come from? Where are you going to get the votes for that, right? And the answer is, well, there'll be a revolution. Okay, but a lot of people want problems fixed right now. They don't want to wait for that, right? As Barack Obama said just a couple weeks ago in a comment, Americans generally, in his view, and he's got experience, uh, tend to look at uh, these issues as evolutionary, not revolutionary. Um, and so Democrats have some conflicts. Um, uh, the, um, uh, but they are having a discussion about these things, but they say things like, um, um, you know, we have to advance human rights, but without regime change. Okay, well, how? How are you going to do it? What's the plan? You know, what, what are you going to do? We're going to restore alliances, right? Rebuild NATO, that kind of thing. How? What exactly are you going to do? What trade-offs are you going to do? Are you going to allow uh, European industry to take, uh, in, in terms of military and whatnot, instead of American, always insisting it be an American platform and so forth, right? So, um, you know, what are we willing to trade to, to make these alliances strong again? Um, and what are you even going to do? You know, Mayor, Mayor Pete Buttigieg was asked a couple of weeks ago on, uh, I think, CNN, um, should Turkey be expelled from NATO, right, because of what's been going on there? And the problem is there's no clause that allows you, even if you want to, uh, expel someone from NATO. You know, and, and I think, uh, frankly, on a political case, uh, Turkey, Hungary, uh, these are countries you might take a look at if you had that kind of architecture, just me speaking personally. Um, but uh, there is no such architecture. And in fact, there is a rule that says you have to have consensus to even make the change, and you can't get consensus to even talk about it, right? So it's not, uh, not going to happen. Um, but somebody needs to come up with some creative, innovative ideas about how we're going to rebuild these transatlantic relations in particular. Um, so um, the implications of this, well, also, very quickly, a couple of other issues in the Democrat Party, just for your information. Um, there are some cleavages for sure. Right now we see the sort of, if you will, the social socialist leaning, you know, Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren sort of to his, a little bit to his right, right? And they're occupying a pretty sizable national uh, percentage. And if one of them dropped out and took the others, they would leap pretty far forward. Pete Buttigieg has moved uh, significantly forward in the state of Iowa. Uh, the more, you know, he's, people are getting to see him and whatnot. He's doing well there. But he has a very low uh, support polling of African Americans in South Carolina, where Joe Biden has had a consistently strong uh, base. And they are the group, especially African American women, that vote most consistently in Democratic primaries. And so Joe Biden's had a real lock on that. And his numbers have been steady you know, throughout. Even every time he's been challenged and he's faltered, he continues to be a very strong national candidate but not as strong in the states now that um, are coming first, right? So that could also tip that a little bit, um, as has happened before. Um, but also, Joe Biden doesn't have much registering support among people under the age of about 25. Uh, and uh, so that's an issue that he would have to figure out, right? Um, so implications here. Um, for Europe and Ireland, and then I'll conclude, because I just want to lay out some parameters here, and then um, I'd much rather talk uh, more, more directly uh, uh, with you all. So um, first of all, I think there's an interesting political dilemma here. Um, the Democrat, whoever it is, probably is going to be attacked as some European-style socialist who wants to take over your health care and all that kind of thing. And so it's kind of a weird thing. They attack European style, right? But Putin is from Europe, last I checked, right? I mean, uh, Orban is from Europe, last I checked. Uh, you know, there's other things happening in Europe right now. And maybe the existential question of our time is, what is going to be the plan to try to effectively and positively, in a, in a constructive way, roll back the illiberal trends we're seeing that are coming out of extra-constitutional outcomes of some of the elections that we've had, or, or even without, like in Turkey and so forth. Um, how do you do that? I don't have the answer to that. But Donald Trump has been very skillful. If you look at his UN speech from September, he says the globalists will not take over, right? The socialists will never govern America. And he a couple times throws in communists too, right? I mean, this is classic McCarthyite type stuff that he's trying to do um, to appeal to a fear of the outside. 
Ironically, if, if you follow the impeachment issues, I mean, what's more globalist and hidden than a president of the United States uh, coordinating a, a campaign uh, illegally, apparently, um, overseas with foreign governments to interfere in our election? I mean, he, has, he is the thing he says that we shouldn't have. Um, and that's a tricky thing to get his supporters to, um, to go in. But it, it really is astonishing. Like, my senator, who I have a lot of respect for, his name is Rob Portman, he's Republican. Um, he had a strong record on foreign policy. Uh, he was the U.S. Trade Representative. You know, and this president stands for everything that this guy's built against his entire career, and yet he supports him continuously. And it's, it's, it's mind-boggling to understand that. You know, that there seems to be some fear of taking him on among the Republicans. My theory on that, and it's purely a theory, is that it's because they did determine after Obama won twice that the demographics in America are changing so much that they really, that they, they, that this is maybe the only way they can hold power right now. Uh, because if you look at some states, like even Texas has predicted with population changes within, maybe sooner, you know, but, but I mean, they've already kicked out a bunch of uh, conservative Republicans from Texas in recent elections. Um, Texas could change, Arizona, um, New Mexico, Colorado already have. Uh, Florida would be up for play. Where I live, Ohio, a lot of the people have moved out of Ohio and moved to Georgia and to Arizona, right? And that's actually changing. So Georgia just had a governor's race where uh, African-American women being very close to defeating the uh, very pro-Trump Republican. But the fact that it's so close in a traditionally very conservative red state, right, uh, tells us, I think, a little bit about the trends. Um, so more broadly, I think, you know, if a Democrat wins the election, you can expect on day one, America returns to the Paris Climate Accords and things like that. But whether America itself will take its own heavy steps on climate, you know, that remains to be seen. Um, but we would per certainly see a lot of uh, plans, you know, restored that were at least under works under Obama and so forth. Um, but the one I think that you really need to watch out for here in Ireland in particular is the trade policy issues. Now, if, you're, if you get Joe Biden or one of those middle lane, Amy Klobuchar, that kind of thing, um, then, then you might have good hope for kind of a return to normal. Um, but um, the Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren view would be uh, not particularly friendly in my assessment to uh, foreign direct investment here in Ireland. And I think this is something you need to be aware of and, 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 and factoring for. Uh, it would be hard to do, but there are certain kinds of, of levers with taxes and whatnot that they could do. Donald Trump tried a little bit with our own corporate tax rate, but it, it, it's certainly not competitive enough even at the lower level. But, but I could see some more. I, I don't think you'd see a major shift on the trade issues. Uh, the Democrats are likely to, in fact, a lot of the appeal that Trump has from some Democratic voters is on these trade, trade concerns. So um, the... Um, and, and then I worry about the sequencing of uh, foreign direct investment, Brexit, um, and the tariffs that are going on worldwide, and even just the potential for normal secular uh, recession, right? But there is a potential, frankly, here for Ireland of a perfect storm, you know, economically. I, I, I'm very pleased to have, be back here and see things going well again. And I can't imagine a scenario would ever go as bad as it did before. But the winds are out there, okay, and, um, and the seas are rising. <laughs> so um, now to conclude here, um, I, I'd like to say a little bit more about Ireland as an example. I've watched Ireland over the years. I wrote a book on it after the collapse of the um, Celtic Tiger and all that. Um, and one of the things that really came out to my mind here um, was the embrace here of multiculturalism. Uh, the referendum on marriage equality uh, uh, was, was, a, was a, a, the way they did it, wherever you sat on it, um, the way they did it was, was, I interviewed the people that ran the campaign and I brought them out to give speech, spe speeches in Ohio and, and, and they did it in a way that allowed people the space they needed to, to, to come to the issue in a comfortable way and to get talking to people, average people, not hitting a like on a Facebook, but people really talking you know, face to face and listening, listening more even than talking. When I believe, and Dan was there visiting when, when this happened, uh, that Hillary Clinton lost that election when she referred to Donald Trump voters uh, I think in early September of 2016 as a basket full of deplorables. These are my friend's parents. These are people I know. They're not deplorable people. They're Republicans. They, they have their views, but, but they're not bad people, right? And if you go out and attack the voter, 
<laughs> you can't really expect a lot to get returned. Also, help if you actually campaigned in Wisconsin and Michigan and Pennsylvania as well. Um, so um, I think that Ireland offers uh, some lessons there in particular. Um, to conclude here, just with these general remarks, um, some of the concerns I have about what's happening in America that resonate internationally, clearly attacks on journalism, attacks on press, despots are watching us, despots are learning how to get away with these things, despots are learning how to remove an ambassador if you don't like what they're saying to you. You know, that's one of the most serious consequences actually for, for, for foreign policy of the impeachment uh, dynamics going on. Um, and also, clearly, the, 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 you know, America's greatness did rise from its soft power appeal, uh, the appeal that it had of, its, of, of sort of you know, the idea of America and whatnot. And again, that idea, at least in my book, does not include separating children from their parents and locking them in cages. You know, this is just an, one of the most appalling things. I never thought I'd see this in my life, um, and I'm sorry about it. <laughs> so um, the um, um, and uh, just to, again to, to, to move to conclude here, uh, the big winners of this four years are Russia and China. Um, they're the winners. They're the ones being made great again here. Um, and I mean, I don't mean that just uh, in terms of um, po politically, but for, for China, they're, you know, they're, they're really getting a lot of opportunities now to move into places. Um, and Russia too on the ground, for example, in Syria and so forth. Um, so anywhere between um, Donald Trump is reelected, or even a ham sandwich could win, right? We just don't really know. Um, but um, against him, uh, he hasn't brought him to his base of appeal. Um, so there's the, you know, the first scenario, and, and frankly, honestly, I would, would predict, and I'm willing to do that here, we'll have to check back and see, but I do think that the Democrat, I mean, I, I think it'd be good money to put down Democrat for the next president of the United States. Um, but I also, for anyone who doesn't like Donald Trump, I wouldn't want you to take that as wishful thinking. Uh, because uh, clearly, um, again, they could drive up the popular vote, but still lose the election. Um, but Donald Trump could run an inside straight again on some key states. They're trying to expand into New Mexico and New Hampshire to make up if they lost Michigan, that kind of thing. But he doesn't have a lot of room for maneuver. That's, that's the thing. So that's why I think structurally it's, it would be favorable to any uh, real serious opponent at this stage. But there's so many scenarios, and any time you hear anyone say, well, the conventional wisdom would suggest, that's immediately where I would say, uh, let's, uh, let's recess that. You know? And so I could imagine scenarios all the way up to, and including that Donald Trump isn't even president by April. Okay, uh, where, and not by impeachment necessarily, but by uh, his own perhaps resignation and deciding he doesn't want to do this anymore and just declare victory, America's great again, go home. Um, ironically, if he did that and they were to pick up somebody like Nikki Haley, who was the former ambassador to the United Nations, a former governor of South Carolina, um, if you ran her against uh, Elizabeth Warren or Bernie Sanders, she'd probably win that election in a landslide. Um, so then, so, so the Republicans have some choices of their own to make going ahead. They could actually have a more likely reelective election possibility um, uh, without Donald Trump. And if they make that calculus, they may make the turn against him. Um, I could also imagine scenarios where um, you could have an electoral college tie and it goes into the House of Representatives to decide the election. These kind of things. I mean, anything is, is possible here. But, um, but the key thing probably for the Democrats to decide is there are a few issues, I mean, the, the question is, do they want to run in the middle lane, make an argument for a return to normalcy, you know, and appeal to people that we're going to have a calm time, and, you know, you can trust the government again, and you just don't, you know, you know we don't have to hear about it every night in the news, you know, or tweets, that kind of thing. Um, and, um, but there are some issues, some key issues, I think, and this will be my last point, that Donald Trump could seize on. Uh, one would be the issue of Medicare for all. The concept is, is perfectly fine. I'm, I'm, we're here in Europe. We understand the benefits of public health care. Um, but uh, this is an issue that he could run on and say, I'm here to defend your freedom. Uh, and by the way, Medicare for all, if you get into the weeds, is a problem for many unions because they actually negotiated uh, lower wages in return for better benefits. And so now the socialists would come in and actually take away their wage, uh, the benefit and, uh, and they'd lose the wage too. So uh, that has not helped them actually in some of these debates. Second key issue that could uh, favor Trump in the election would be guns. Um, you know, personally speaking, I'm not a fan, although I do support people's right, of course, to hunt and things like that. Um, 
but, um, but, the, but this could be a big issue. And when you heard uh, Beto O'Rourke, who dropped out of the race, and he was very understandably upset, rightly so, after El Paso shooting, right? Uh, but uh, he did say, yes, we're coming into your, I think effectively, into your basement to get your guns. And, and that is just a trigger warning. <laughs> that's the wrong phrase. Um, that's, a, that's a warning for, sign for many uh, um, people who would be very opposed to that, including many Democrats, right? Uh, right around where I live in Ohio, rural Ohio, they, they really appreciate their right to bear these arms. I personally don't, but um, that's, that's a choice they make. Um, and um, the third issue is a little minor minutia, but they are um, advocating uh, Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren and a couple others for decriminalizing illegal border crossings. Um, and that would be in Donald Trump's wheelhouse uh, in terms of uh, immigration issues. Um, so basically, there's a, a, a whole range of scenarios, uh, all the way up to um, a landslide defeat of Donald Trump. And, and um, you know, I don't want to project or, or, or offer a w wishful thinking here, but um, the way these elections have been going in the suburbs, in, in this, in, and that's why that more moderate kind of middle path may be the pathway to victory, as opposed to, oh, we'll have a revolution and bring benefits to everybody. Um, that's been the evidence so far, that these elections have been winning in the suburbs, and that requires probably a more moderate uh, uh, approach. So the question is, will the Democrats end up with a candidate that can fill that lane? Or, or if they don't, will it be sufficient that it's just not Donald Trump? And um, that's what we're going to find out over the months ahead. An interesting 12 months. Good. Thank you. Sir.